generations after they arrived in 1732, my eighth grand grandfather was born in 1774, which is Michael Tabler, who we're focusing this talk about, and the Michael Tabler that is buried in Tabletown. So that was nearly 247 years ago. Well, about the same time, uh, Hannah, the slave, was born on Michael's father's plantation in 1775. So that was 246 years ago, approximately. Um, around 1791 to 1809, we've calculated that Hannah would have been approximately 16 years old. So the, the story that was told us, we know about the six slave children that were emancipated and brought to Ohio. But then by reading uh, and doing some research, we discovered about how black slave women, what they called breeders, were treated. And Hannah probably fell in that category. And being conservative, hoping that maybe they did not start breeding Hannah until she was 16 years old, she potentially could have had 18 or more children before the children that we know about that were emancipated and brought to Ohio. <coughs> so she was born in 1775. And when we first started telling this oral history, we knew about these six children. John being born in 1810, Jess being born in 1811, Michael and Isaac being born in 1812, they were twins. In 1814, William was born. In 1816, Maria was born. So you kind of get the feel for what I'm talking about when I refer to slave women, they were used as breeders. It's not a term I like, but this is exactly how they talk. They expected slave women to continuously to have children every year. So we know that Michael's father did not approve of the relationship that Michael had with Hannah. And it kind of makes sense that Michael and Hannah had a relationship because, again, Michael born 1774, Hannah born 1775. They probably grew up together. Um, 1813. Well, let me back up for a second. Michael's father was so distraught about the relationship he had with Hannah. We were told that he dispersed Hannah to different plantation and some of her children probably to different plantations because now all of Michael's father's children have their own plantations. Yeah. So then we, then we learned in 1813, Michael purchased Hannah back from his sister. 339. Then we learned in 1818, Michael freed Hannah. So this is very, very early in the slave industry that he freed her. So sometime between 1818 and 1830, Michael has now acquired six of Hannah's slave children, the six that we know about, the six that were emancipated and brought to Ohio. So in 1830, Michael emancipated six of Hannah's slave children. And on the document, this was an oral history that was passed down for 150 years or so before we actually found a document proving it. Uh, the manumission document of 1830 names all the children that I, I just pre-mentioned that Michael had emancipated in 1830. But the most important thing on that document and, and I feel is he says he does this because of the affection he has for them so for a white slave owner to say that about a slave in 1830 is pretty amazing Tony is the slideshow not working 
I'm not seeing any slides. Davey didn't tell me when to start. Oh, I, I, will, I will start the slideshow. I will start the slideshow right now, well, Dave. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. So, okay. So, sometime, you know, if you had this slide of Hannah and Michael, they could see what, what our, our interpretation of them looked like. If you could bring it up of Michael, which is probably one of the first ones. Yeah. Uh, so now we know that they were emancipated in 1830. Michael has affection for them. And somewhere between 1830 and 1835, Michael decides to move them out of the state of Virginia, which is now West Virginia, to Ohio. And this was not an easy move, and it probably took him a long time to decide where and when. The one of the reasons that we know it wasn't an easy move because you know the, the book that uh, I aforementioned uh, to you earlier, Tony, The Bone and Sinew of the Land by Dr. Annalisa Cox talks and tells us how difficult it was for blacks, free or slave, to move about the country and the, the rivers were lined with slave catchers. So one of the questions this book helped answer for me was, I couldn't understand why our ancestors moved out of a slave state into Ohio and settled so close to the Ohio River. And after reading her book, I've come to the conclusion, probably that one of the big salvations of the Tabor family was that Michael was a white man. And these slave catchers would not dare steal the property of a white man. So that was very enlightening for me because we did have some family that left this area that went on into, uh, into Canada. So around 1830, they decide to move into Ohio. And one of the reasons I believe they probably chose this area, Michael growing up on his, father plant, his father's plantation would have known the importance of a mill because his father owned mills on their plantation. And Michael, most likely being literate, probably would have read about a mill in Ohio called the Barrows Mill, 1803, that um, was one well, the first mill to produce white flour. That's pretty impressive right here at Tate, what we call Taylor Town now. The other thing that Michael possibly would have read about Mr. Barrows is that he was arrested and taken to Marietta because he refused to give up a fugitive slave. So if you were looking for a place to settle with your newly freed slave children, and their mother, Mr. Barrows, is probably a pretty good neighbor. Michael Tabler, one of the things I like to tell about is that the difference between Thomas Jefferson and the Sally Hemings story and our story is that Thomas Jefferson did make arrangements to free some of his slaves. The difference between Thomas Jefferson and Michael Tabler is Tom, Michael Tabler freed his slaves and then he moved and lived with his slaves after he freed them. And he stayed with them in Tabler town until he died in 1843. It's funny when we were starting to put this together, uh, a gentleman helped me with the slideshow. We discovered that you know, it was actually February 11th, which would have been the anniversary of Michael's death, which would have been 247 years ago in Tabertown. The, uh, the stone in Tabertown that, uh, that you just saw there on the slideshow 
was restored by Dr. Thomas Walker and his family because of their connection. He was a high university professor, retired now. Um, he has a direct connection to Taylortown. One connection being that the Munn family, which he descends, sold the Tablers some of their first property in 1836. So the slide that's up now, that is of William Tabler and Ruth Corbin. William is the only photo we have, and we do have a, a chalk drawing of William and Ruth, that the slave that was actually emancipated. And Ruth is um, some of the first Native American ancestry that we know about coming into our family. The oral history told us that she was Nipmunk, that she was brought to Athens County by the Grosvenor family. So that's pretty early. So some people asked, I'll just ask like Tony asked this question. <laughs> so how did the People of Color exhibit get started? Um, around 2002, I walked into the Kennedy Museum at Ohio University with a box full of my stuff. And uh, I had basically just asked them, had they ever considered doing uh, an exhibit about local history? Because I felt that <clears throat> some of the items that my family had produced over the years were very beautiful, like quilts and etc. And so from that, that's how the people of color exhibit was. That's, that's how it came to be at the Kennedy Museum in 2003. It went up and was very successful. Successful. Um, the slide that's up there now is uh, just kind of like a family tree depicting Michael, Hannah, and the six slave children. That is another picture of William, a chalk drawing done again. He is, uh, let's see, I think 1814. He was born in 1814, a slave, freed in 1830. Um, this is his wife, Ruth Corbin, uh, Native American. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when they did the census, early census records, they didn't really say what kind of Indian, they would just put Indian kind of left them all in one category. You can go to the next slide if you'd like. This is uh, my interpretation of Hannah done by a, a gentleman I work with named Mark Payton. And we came up with this drawing using uh, family photos, you know, like people like my mother, you know, who's 82, Geraldine Tabler, who's, you know, in her nineties. Uh, and I thought he'd done an excellent job, you know, because you can see the resemblance of uh, William in, in that drawing. So if you want to go to the next one, Tony. That is a manumission document. Uh, that is the actual handwriting. We have one of it transcribed. And again, the most important thing on this document is that Michael says, I am doing this because of the affection I have for them. That's pretty amazing for uh, a slave owner in 1830 to say. Next slide, Tony, please. The oral history was told to us, like I said, for almost 150 years. And this letter was the first time we believe the history was written down. It was some of our white ancestors back in what is now West Virginia, riding to Tabertown to ask about their descendant who took his slaves into the wilderness. And Daniel Dennis Tabler wrote the story down that I just told you roughly. <laughs> um, and I think that was done that he is, Daniel Dennis is the son of Thomas Jefferson Tabler, who was a Civil War soldier. You can go to the next slide, Tony. This is back to the plantation in uh, the Martinsburg, West Virginia area, which would have been Virginia at the time. 
and it just shows some of the ruins. Uh, there was a whole group of us that went there, you know, um, Sherry Walker and her mother, uh, Mildred Vore, uh, Alvin Adams, my mother. Uh, so we all got to go to the plantation where our ancestors descended from. You can go to the next slide, Tony. Again, some more ruins. This was, I believe, was actually of the plantation uh, house itself. Next slide, Tony. This was a cabin uh, on the plantation, and it was believed we actually had a guide that was a relative. Uh, this was actually a slave cabin. Uh, when my uncle Al first went there, the cabin was still standing. So you can go to the next slide, Tony. This is what the uh, cabin would have looked like uh, when our ancestors would have stayed there. So it was a pretty nice cabin. I live in a log cabin today. <clears throat> this is the uh, interpretation of the Barrows Mill by Charles Byron. Uh, he's a local artist and also author of the book, Sog of the Hawking. Uh, he did several mills on Federal Creek and around the Stewart Geisel area. So this would have been uh, what a typical mill would have looked like on Federal Creek. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This was actually the handwriting of uh, Daniel Dennis Tabler who wrote back to the inquiry about the slaves. And that was actually part of the 2003 exhibit. Next slide, though. This is a uh, part of the exhibit, and I hope everyone who's seen this will, will, you know, the idea that we would have people come would have been, been great, but under the circumstances, this is the next best thing. But at some point, I would, I invite, encourage all of you to come to see the exhibit. There's nothing like putting your feet on the ground here. Uh, so in this display here is basically a lot of our family Heirlooms, I guess, if you want to say. Um, they're, go to the next slide, Tony. I think that'll bring it in a little clearer. Like this plate, this saucer, fork and spoon, sugar bowl, salt and pepper shaker, were Marie Harris Lucas, my wife's grandmother. The saucer and fork and spoon were given to her when uh, she was three years old. So it's well over hundred years old. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, the sugar bowl there belonged to my grandmother in the middle. And the bone handle knife and fork set belonged to my great grandmother, the mother of Elsie Tabler. Her name was Emily Sims. So those have been in the family for a long time. I bought them at our family's auction when they auctioned off my grandmother's stuff when I was probably about 15 years old. I think I paid a dollar fifty for them. <clears throat> Next item, please. So our families, since they were so early here, have really participated in every war this country's ever been in. And uh, we still have men and women that are serving in the military. But I was, you know, became fascinated by the Civil War history uh, when my grandmother told me the gentleman on the right of the photo was Jerry Sims. He was born in 1822 in Virginia and probably came to uh, Athens County when the Taylors came. Um, so this is just showing some of the general items uh, in, in the Civil War display that I have. That is an, an actual, that is an actual Civil War era flag that has 36 stars. Next slide, Tony. Again, this is Jerry Sims. This is the photo that got me fascinated about our family history. This is the photo that's on a tin type that my grandmother showed me when I was, I, I'm guessing, maybe 13 years old. And when she told me that my great-great-grandfather, you see, is that right? Her grandfather, my dad's great, yeah, my great-great-grandfather served in the Civil War. Boy, I, I really caught the bug. And his name was Jerry Sims. He was born in 1822, and we believe that he actually may 
they have married Maria, the emancipated slave, the only woman that was emancipated in 1830. So next slide, Tony. <clears throat> this is what uh, Jerry Sims would have looked like in his Civil War uniform. Again, he was born in 1822. So he was actually like 40 years old when he started in the Civil War. This is our interpretation of Thomas Jefferson Tabler, what he would have looked like in the Civil War. <clears throat> Next slide, please. In the exhibit we have, this is on my wife's side of the family, Tillman Newman. Tillman Newman was killed at the Battle of New Market Heights and Chaffin's Farm during the Civil War. Uh, next slide, Tony. <clears throat> the reason Tillman Newman is so important to our family history is because this is a photo of Milton Holland. He's in the courthouse in Athens. As far as I know, he, may be the only person from Athens County to have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And he received that at the Battle of New Market Heights in Chaffin's Farm, where all the military white officers were either killed or wounded. And Milton Holland took his non-commissioned black officers and uh, won the day. And the uh, can you go back to the slide before that, Tony? Can you go backwards? That battle, uh, Tillman Newman was killed at on my wife's side of the family. I actually interviewed Pearlie Singer and she told me this story and I went and looked it up. It's, it was truly amazing. And the story they were told as he was killed at that battle and uh, his body was thrown in a well. He was never given a burial. So we can go to the next couple of slides, please. In the exhibit, this is something I'm very proud of. This is uh, an 1840s pistol that uh, was given to me by my uncle Floyd Butcher, who found this in some of our ancestors' uh, belongings. So this pistol has been in our family a long time. I'm really proud of that piece. <clears throat> um, this is my great uncle, my grandfather's brother, Elias Butcher. He was a War I veteran and it was his military shells that my great aunt Nanny gave me that got me started collecting when I was probably five or six years old. <clears throat> he lost his leg after World War I, but because he was a veteran, he was entitled to, um, he was entitled to a military leg, but he didn't like it. So he went out into the woods and got him some split hickory and made his own wooden leg. And that's his wooden leg and his cane. So we have military shells that he brought back from World War I. We have his wooden leg, his cane. We have what I call the three-sided trench knife that he carried during World War I. <clears throat> okay. This is on my wife's side of the family. His name is... Granville Lucas, he's buried up on Hagee Ridge, just outside of Tabor Town here. He was in the Civil War. But the unique thing about Granville Lucas is that he was in the Navy during the Civil War. So that's pretty fascinating to me. So next slide, please. Um, our ancestors came into Tabor Town was now called Kilbert around 1830. And of course, by 1850, coal was a big king and railroads started coming into Tabor Town. So there was actually uh, a point where there were, you know, they were five, almost five lines intersecting in Tabor Town. One coming from Stewart, one coming from New England, one coming from Amesville, and one coming from Cutler. And it was all about getting the coal. And these are some actual implements that our ancestors would have used in the, the Jenkins mine, which is in Tabor Town, and the Big Four mine, which is between Tabor Town and, and Broadwell. So next slide, please. 
these are some of the civil civil war memorabilia that i'm very proud of uh, the civil war war belt buckle was found by my father-in-law lerman flowers with a metal detector he was an expert metal detector so this was a civil war belt buckle found in what is probably one of the earliest schools which was probably on the munn property in taylor town and the, the three badges around were found on the Harris Farm on Big Run, which is right out of Tabor Town. The one in the far right corner was the Sons of Veterans badges. I, I actually interviewed a gentleman who remembered his brothers being a part of that. So if you were the son of a soldier of the Civil War, you could join this organization. And in the top left, you're, you're seeing a brass ring that belonged to my great great grandfather Jerry Sims, 1820, born in 1822, and uh, fought in the Civil War. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, this is just uh, part of the exhibit that I, I made a sign, kind of showing some of the interest uh, why people came to Tabor Town the Barrows Mill, lumber, white flour, train depot, coal. Sorghum was made in Tabor Town. Uh, they had their own little um, blacksmith shop, et cetera. Train stop. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this is just something we had made up for the exhibit uh, when we had it down there, uh, just showing that Tabor Town was founded around 1830. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, Michael, one of the big interests he would have had and where he was going to settle would have been the, the Barrows Mill on Federal Creek, which is in Tabor Town, basically. So this is a piece that I've had for probably nearly 40 years now. It was donated to me by Bill Brady. He bought the farm on, on Featherston Road, and I confirmed to him where he got this. It was in the hayloft. And so basically, here was the hayloft, and here was the Barrows Mill. So I am convinced that almost 100% that as an actual piece of the 1803 Barrows Mill. Pretty proud of that. Tony, next slide, please. <clears throat> this is an actual photo proving that Michael would have known and understood the importance of the mill. So this was an actual mill on the Tabler plantation. When we visited there, um, of course, all the wooden structure was gone. There was just stones. So, it, but it does tell us that Michael really had a good understanding of the mills and how important they were. And when he brought his family to settle here, um, I'm sure he took that in consideration. So can you imagine being a slave born from 1810 to 1816, freed in 1830, and then brought to Ohio by the mid 1830s, each of these slaves have their own farm. Next slide, Tony, please. And this was just an article written many, many years ago about my great, great grandfather, Jerry Sims, uh, the grave where he was buried back in the woods. This is the gentleman that had the, the brass ring in the Civil War collection. Next slide, please. This is my great aunt, Nanny, uh, my grandmother, Elsie Tabler's sister. So there were two Tabler sisters that married two butchers. This woman was so important in my life, one, because she, she helped take care of me when I was little. She babysat me. Um, she also, probably understood what she was doing, but I didn't understand. She had given me the World War I shells that her husband brought back. And all I did was play with them for, you know, 20 years before I realized the importance of them. But uh, Nanny was a very important person. She was also a midwife, delivered dozens of kids in the area. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is her father. And my grandmother's father, W.J. Tabler, uh, William Jasper, they called him. Uh, he was a coal miner. 
and uh, his father, Adam Tabor, would have been born about 1853. But I was fortunate enough to remember him as a child. And uh, so I was very thankful for those memories. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, kind of like an overview of the exhibit. As you can see in the far back, there's a lot of Native American uh, artifacts. My father really loved our Native American ancestry. And he lived and worked with the Navajo Indians and Hopi Indians in Arizona for 10 years. And that's where he died. <clears throat> so in, in the exhibit, we have you know, just a lot of photos we hope to improve. Uh, because some of these photos were done back in 2003 from the Kennedy Museum. <clears throat> and uh, next slide, please. And again, that was just a Civil War collection. We've talked about that one already. Next slide. <clears throat> this was a, a beautiful day in Tabor Town. This was when we rededicated Michael Tabor's tombstone. Um, that was restored by Ohio University's Dr. Tom Walker and descendant of the Munn family. Um, that was a, it was just a beautiful day that the little fellow carrying the flag up front there is my youngest son, Isaiah Butcher, who was probably seven years old at the time. But we had a really nice turnout and uh, we're thankful to the Walker family and the Munn descendants for helping us restore the stone. <clears throat> Next slide. And I asked him to uh, add this book because I think any of our ancestors and people of interest and interest in Black history in the Northwest Territory, I highly recommend this book by Dr. Annalisa Cox. It has changed my whole thought process of why our ancestors moved when they did. So um, I highly recommend that book. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just uh, my contact information. Uh, the People of Color exhibit basically is just me. Um, we have had a lot of people help uh, to get us to this point. And if I may, Tony, can I take a moment to thank some of the people that uh, have helped, helped me during this time? Of course. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to name everyone, but I definitely wanna name a few. Um, Sherry Walker has just been a tremendous asset and relative of mine. Anytime I need her, she's always there. Brianna Walker, her doc daughter, is becoming one of the great archivists of the, of the century. I think she has over 10,000 ancestors in her database. Linda Tabler and Sandy, or uh, Linda Tabler Mel and Sandy Tabler Smith, both of the Kilbert Church. Every time I need their help, they're always there. Gladys Flowers Honesty, a great researcher, has been, been uh, keeping the family history for a long time, has volumes and volumes of research. My mother, Desi Nichols Workman, my wife, Rose Flowers Butcher. And I gotta say this about the Flowers family on the live side or she'll be angry with me. The Tablers have been here a long time, since the 1830s. The Flowers family have one of the first documented marriages in Athens County in 1817. And she likes to point that out to me a lot. <laughs> so we're, but we're very proud of that. And then Geraldine Tabler, who is, you know, one of our great keepers of our history, has an amazing Tabler Town collection. She survived the 1937 tornado uh, and has shared that story. Uh, again, Dr. Tom Walker, and Dr. Annalisa Cox for her influence and in, uh, research in this. And uh, I think we're ready for questions, Tony, if uh, anybody has any. Okay, anyone? Have, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Anyone? Feel free, just unmute yourself before you ask a question or you can type <laughs> it in the chat. <laughs> I'll go ahead and jump in if that's all right. So, yeah, so uh, thank you, Uncle Dave. I've grown up hearing these stories, and um, I just, every time I hear them, I just, I'm, I don't know, it just moves me. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I, like I said, I kind of grew up hearing these stories, too, um, just from being little, walking through the woods with Uncle Dave and Uncle Al and Dad, 
Mm -hmm. And I guess something I was wondering is you talk a lot about the oral history and how that how that is how these stories were preserved. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, I've always wanted to ask you and I always forget until just now, but mm -hmm. um, when was the first time you can kind of remember hearing um, the oral history um, of the story about Michael and Hannah and just how that story kind of came to you? Um, like when's your earliest memory of hearing that? Um, of course, our grandmother, Elsie Tabler, would have told us about some of the Tabler history, but I think I was pretty old and I was probably hearing, starting to hear some of the stories that Ted Tabler was telling. You know, he's a very important part of our, our history and his wife, Frida, um, and keeping this story alive. And then when my, you know, your uncle, my uncle, uh, Alvin Adams, started researching it boy that's when the gates were really open so i'm going to guess i was a pretty young teenager before i actually heard the story that where it made sense to me about michael and hannah and you know and i'd like to point out too while i got you on here that we didn't we wasn't for sure if hannah ever made it here you remember early on yeah. uh we didn't know if hannah had made it uh and then uh, Sherry Walker had found an 1840s or 1850 census that showed an elderly woman of color in Michael's household. And so that's really the only indication that we have that Hannah had made it. But I'd say pretty, I was pretty young, younger than you. <laughs> Thanks for asking the question. Uh, thank you. You have another one? <laughs> well, I got all kinds, but... <laughs> Well, I don't want to dominate the conversation or anything. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> I will say one thing real quick, though, is you asked me earlier about the uh, the, the date of the will when we yeah. first started, and it was 1827. 1827. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. That was the uh, will of Michael Tabor's father, which uh, he, he, you know, at, upon his will, correct me, Kenton, if I'm wrong, upon his death, all his slaves were sold but one. Mm -hmm. And it was a child named Hannah. And we kind of believe that this was one of our Hannah's children. And the point I was making early on, and, uh, you know, it kind of goes in a circle that I want to understand that Hannah, by the time she was giving birth to the children that we knew about, because when we first learned this story, we thought these were the only children. Right. And then you start researching the, about how they treated slave women and the, that she potentially had 18 or 20 more children before our ancestors. And she would have been on like in her late 30s. She would have been, you know, in her later years of her life, you know, as far as childbearing years. Thanks for bringing that up, Kenton. Oh, of course. Happy to help. <laughs> So David, this is Lori Thompson. Hi, Lori. Um, I was wondering, I, you've kind of alluded to the fact that there are census records mm -hmm. of Michael and his family. Are there census records of Michael, his and Hannah and the six children? Yeah, in the 1840, I mean, forgive me for not having the exact date, but I think it was either the 1840 or 1850 census. Okay. There's a beautiful census record showing all the children and their property because they as soon as they got here, he had bought them farms. Okay. Probably used his mother's inheritance because his father disinherited him. And so they're all listed. But as an afterthought, it's like someone wrote this beautiful cursive and then about half the size went to the top and wrote Michael. He was an older man and he had this older lady in his household. They didn't give names of women, you know, how it was, you know. Right. So Right. She was, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 years old, a person of color, that kind of thing. But you don't have any records of where she would be have been buried or anything? Uh, we haven't found that yet. And I, I just can't believe that if she died before Michael, uh, that I'm convinced she's buried in Tabertown Cemetery. Right. And the reason we have lost so much of our history, and this is one of the things we're going to be working on with Rural Action, is to restore the cemetery. The cemetery is on top of a coal mine, the Jenkins yeah. coal mine, and it's been sinking and sunk graves for years. <laughs> we're going to try to retrieve some of them and save some. Very 
Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Hi, David. Uh, this is Joanne Smith. Uh, Hi. Have you written a book or anything on this? No, I, way, I, I, said. I, I haven't. And I do hope in the near future that we can come up with a, uh, even if it's a child's book, telling this story because it's important to keep this alive. And there are some people that are working on some, some books in the family. Um, and I'm all for it, uh, whatever it takes to keep this story alive. So um, I'm, I'm not a writer by profession, but you know, I can talk if somebody wants to, to, to write it down. <laughs> well, write what you talk. We I'll, all understand it. All right, thanks for the question. <laughs> Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dave, I have a question for you. Sure, Tony. Um, <laughs> if you remember years ago, um, you know, Monica as well, we worked on a project with OU Wayne National Forest connecting families of color to that land, mm -hmm. um, which of course, when we found out the land was stripped away. Uh, originally, they wanted to, wanted us to focus on a few families as well as do scholarly research. Now, if you remember the, connect, the discussion with Vibert, Dr. Vibert Cambridge and, and other people, we mentioned to them the importance of oral, oral history within our families of color, as well as everyone in Appalachia, whites in Appalachia as well. What's your opinion on the oral history versus documented history, if you will? <clears throat> well, let's just say I, I spoke early on that this oral history is nearly 200 years old now. And I have yet to find anybody that's ever shown me any definitive research that would ever make me believe anything different. Uh, my young nephew there, Kenton Butcher, working on his PhD, uh, he'll tell you, I mean, it's, it's very hard to disprove, disprove this oral history. If anything, we have uh, proven it, you know, with the manumission document, you know, with the purchase of Hannah, with the freedom of Hannah, uh, Etc. So, <clears throat> oral history is wonderful, and um, but when you have a document to back it up, it's, it really, really makes it very important. Dave, there's a question on in the chat room from okay. Brittany. She she wants to know how you began sharing this history with others. <clears throat> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. You know, when I walked into the Kennedy Museum back in 2000, you know, I, I had been fought. First of all, let me say this. I've been following my uncle Al Adams around. I wanted to be a journalist like him. I wanted to be a photographer like him. I wanted to be a researcher like him. So I, I learned from someone who really understood the importance of what you did and what you said. Um, as, as following him, I, I, I feel like I just, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> there are some people in the families who are giving different tasks. Items come to me, you know, from the World War II shells to wooden legs, to brass rings, to photos. Um, and you become like the caretaker. It's like your ancestors are encouraging you to keep this story alive. And I can't explain that other than it is ancestors and the, the knowledge that was passed down to me. And now I feel like, like my nephew, uh, Kenton, my nephew, Christopher, Brianna Walker. Uh, these are the next generation of kids that are going to keep this story alive for the next 200 years. And how did I get started? Was that the question? <laughs> um, I think I started going into schools. When I found out about the Civil War and our connection, I started going into schools talking to uh, kids about my uh, ancestors in the Civil War. And then, you know, the Kennedy Museum. Um, we had over a thousand children. It was one of the best attended exhibits in the history of the Kennedy Museum. So, Uncle Al did a lot of talking there. I did a lot of talking there. And from there on, it just, it's, it's been amazing to me uh, in the last few years, the knowledge has come in, the help I've had from ancestors and, and relatives and cousins. 
Uh, it's, it's been per, truly amazing. Uh, I probably forgot some of the names of people who, who've helped me and I, and I apologize. Um, if I did, you know, Susan Terry was another one, you know, uh, who's willing to share photos, uh, of our ancestors. And I have, we, through the internet have been able to reach out to people I've never met who live in California, who have descendants that came from Tabertown and are just now finding out about it. I think that's fascinating, fascinating. Anyone I hope else? that answered your question. <laughs> Anyone else have any, I have a question today about why people are thinking about questions they wanna ask. Okay. Over the years, um, names for our people. And again, it's easy for us as human species to label and classify other people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy for us to recognize them as a result. So over the years, our people um, have been identified as many different names or terms or labels, such as Melungeon, Triracial, Winds, um, you know, uh, I lost tribe at one point. What's your opinion on some of those names? <laughs> I guess I'll go back to the wisdom of my grandfather, uh, Reverend Lewis Butcher. He had a church that was non-denominational, meaning everybody was welcome. Uh, so I kind of take that if, for anyone to believe that's been in this country any amount of time that they are 100% this or 100% that, boy, you're sadly mistaken. I just heard uh, Dr. Lewis Gates say last night, on finding your roots that literally every black American in the United States that's been here any time at all has white ancestry. Now you think about that for a minute. Uh, and then <laughs> I'm trying to think of the uh, famous author. I made a note because what he said I thought was just really amazing, but um, his name, will, his name will come to me here shortly, but he made the comment. He said that uh, my grandmother never raped anybody. And however this came to be, like I said, you know, with, uh, with slaves, Indians, you know, Tabletown, uh, you know, the Flowers family, you know, wild Native American ancestry, you know, some of them look like full-blooded Irish. Um, we have German ancestry. Our grandfather, Michael, basically was a full-blooded German. He was only, a, you know, three or four generations out of Germany. Um, and my uncle Alvin made the comment one time that do you think our family was here from the 18... 40s or 1830s to the present without wanting to marry somebody. <laughs> you know? So I think he made his point. People, I, I just feel like uh, it's easy to get caught up in calling yourself this, calling yourself that. And, and I, I, I'm all for that if that's what people want to do. Uh, we have a lot of people that have, you know, Native American ancestry. They're really proud of that, and they continue it on. But I, I, I focus on what I know. I, I've had my DNA done. You know, I had one percent Native American. My son had two percent. Uh, you know, we have African American. We have European. I mean, it just goes on and on. It just goes on and on. This has been going on for a long time. People are humans. I hope that answered your question, Tony. That kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> made a loop. Yeah. Around. <laughs> definitely answer our question because historically, if you look at the term Melungeon, it comes from actually the Newman Ridge, Ridge area mm -hmm. in Tennessee, and of course, the male family was Philippi, Barber County, West Virginia. And you actually made a plug to one of our cousins, Henry Louis Gates. Or yeah. Louis Gates. Good job. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe we can get him come visit uh, our little exhibit here somewhere. Well, if you're listening, made, Dr. Liz Gates, we'd love to have you come down to Tabor Town because we have a lot of male descendants that you descend from, and I believe you're my cousin as well. <laughs> exactly. exactly. 
<laughs> You'll probably be calling you any minute, Tony. <laughs> I'm ready for the fun right there. Okay. <laughs> any other question for for David? I know there are lots of discussions on chat. And if you're familiar with the Our Town series, um, it's ran by, I forget the organization, but Evan Shaw is in charge of it. I proposed the idea years ago when he did one for Morgan County, which I was interviewed in regard to Underground Railroad in that area. But I proposed that he do an Arts Town series on people of color in this area. He's actually uh, been here. He, he did been, one for he's Athens. He's been to the exhibit. He's interviewed Geraldine Tabler and my mother. Oh, wow. Uh, of course, you know, he's very involved with the NFL football. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the process for Evan Shaw has been started, and I, I hope he continues. Uh, I hope he finishes it someday. Let's hope so. Yeah. Any other question for David? All of you, did you get a chance to, to get his information from his car, card? Simply have a nod or something. If not, I can bring that slide back up quickly for all of you to write down David's information. David is becoming a newfound or developing a newfound love for Zoom. So maybe in the future, <laughs> people do more Zoom um, programs. But I would encourage anyone that uh, hasn't been to our area, generally when the Ohio University um, was really the driving force for me to actually start showing the exhibit. They called, they had a big group from Ghana. These were adults, these weren't kids. This has been two or three years ago now and said, hey, they're coming, they would like to learn more about local history. Can you, can you do something? And my wife and my mom, we went out in this little pole barn we had and we set up some things. And, and uh, so when people come here, I live on the Hawking River and we're the, we're the Federal Creek meets the Hawking River. It's where the earliest pioneers came to Athens County. So we tour the exhibit, and then we'll go to the Pioneer Cemetery, which is from the late 1700s, uh, has the oldest shell bark hickory tree in the second oldest in the state of Ohio. Uh, but another fascinating thing about the cemetery, which is on the farm right beside of me here, is uh, some of the tombstones have menorahs on them. And I've never, I have yet to find any historian who has researched about these early Jewish descendants who were their first non-natives to come here. So, and then we go to Tabor Town and uh, uh, we'll see the Tabor Cemetery, the Tabor Church. Um, it's, uh, it's a couple hours and uh, love to have people come. So you're, you're all invited. And of course, Dave, we could also take them to the Multicultural Genealogical Center in Chester Hill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be connected Absolutely. to the Underground Railroad. Yeah. yeah. And Quakers, built by Quakers. Yeah. Dave, there was a question on in the chat room. Somebody asked, or I'm sorry, Rachel asked, how can we support restoring the cemetery? How can they uh, offer support? Uh, we are, you know, we, I don't have any kind of status as far as a nonprofit organization, but I'm very involved with the Kilbert Church, who is the caretaker of the cemetery in the township. So uh, if you wanted to make a donation to the Kilbert Church, or I could see that it got to them, uh, I, I mentioned their name, Linda Tabler Mail and Sandy uh, Tabler Smith, both are uh, very involved members, and it could be acquisition through them. But uh, we, will, we will only work with the stones uh, that we have permission to work, to work with. So any support we can have. And uh, right now, I'm in conversation with Rural Action uh, to get a group here to, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Tom Walker, who restored the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the tombstones on the ridges at the mental hospital and has a connection to Tabor Town because he's a Mun descendant. So uh, we have some expertise and uh, a group willing. So um, that's what we're gonna be working on. Any help would be greatly appreciated. All right, and, and I, I did put the slide back up for anyone else who needs to write down Dave's address. Don't show up at his house unannounced, but um, <laughs> address, a phone number, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's uh, so if you want to come, the best thing to do is call or text me, and then we can set up uh, a schedule. 
Any other questions? Tony, before you, I just want to thank David again for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us here today at Merida College. And I want to thank uh, all those who took the time to join Zoom to be a part of this program. Um, and I'm inviting you to come back and as we get ready for Women's History Month. And so if you have some extraordinary women that you think you should highlight, um, share the information with myself or Tony, because we'd love to be able to share local women um, through this meeting as well. So again, thank you and happy Wednesday. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Monica, for this opportunity. And uh, I hope everybody forgives me because this is my first <laughs> time uh, talking about our family history um, on, on Zoom. And, and I, I hope you find it was worth your time. Great, thank you. Great job. And, and Dave, I, I think it's great to point that I, I love when institutions want to um, us to display our local culture around Black History Month. Yeah. Uh, myself, I'm speaking at Miami University tomorrow evening on Black yeah. Indians in the area. So mm. it's fascinating that people have that curiosity. Well, you know, it's people like you, Tony and, and Monica, that are putting us out there and uh, giving us these opportunities. And you know, I'm not a I'm not a professional speaker by any means. I'm not a, an author or anything. But anytime I get the chance to share our family history and our story to help keep it alive, I'm I'm going to do it. Thank you. Well, Dave, I want to thank you one more time. We did record the the session, so if you want to share it with some of your friends and family, uh, let us know. Uh, we we were a little short and we started started the recording, but 